it was the blood that Jesus, oh, he shed for me. Oh, it was way, way, way back on Calvary. Oh, the blood. Salvation and 
This is our 21 days of uh, consecration, consecration, and um, it starts off on a communion Sunday, so that's a little different than in years past. So tonight, um, as the only night in these 21 days, we'll actually have communion. Um, but after that, uh, i just talk a little bit about something that I think is pertinent for today. Uh, we'll take communion, and then we'll have prayer. Prayer tonight. Um, consists um, with the, the melody either, either from up there or down here and then also just praying about us giving ourselves over to God. Amen? And so the first seven days is about giving something, us giving to God. And so as you read your 
uh, sheets for the week. We'll give to God um, ourselves and we'll give our finances and we'll give our gifts and callings. We'll give our praise and worship. And it's about our ministry to the Lord. Amen. And allowing him to have those things. And then after that, we'll have 14 days of concentrated prayer uh, on ministry that takes place here in the Potter's House and how God wants to touch those ministries along with some key words and key elements like truth and love and sacrifice and repentance and those things will be there as well so they'll be on those sheets if you don't have it uh, the sheets for the 21 days of consecration I saw that there were some still out in the atrium you want to get that and you can stay in tune for what God has for you and what um, the Lord is doing for us corporately and then also um, on Mondays just to be reminded that that is your day of ministry and we're asking that if you don't have any particular ministry to do on that day that you reach out to family, friends, and express that same type of love to them and give them that opportunity. Pray with them and call them and encourage them uh, in the same area that God is encouraging us. Amen. There are also meditation scriptures. Uh, we're out of Proverbs and prayerfully everybody read all 31 of those. Amen. Amen. Just clap anyway. If you didn't, you can catch up. Uh, all five chapters of James. You've got 21 days to catch up on that. And then there are concentrate, concentrated scriptures for us each and every day. So we want to do that. All right. So tonight, I want to look at a couple of scriptures. I don't have uh, my screen in front of me there. So I'm going to have to turn here because I've got a different translation. Um, I want to look at um, Hosea chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. And then I will read John chapter 15. Uh, verse verses 1 and 2 amen thank you Pam praise team two great songs amen reading from the Amplified I'm, tonight, tonight I want to talk a little bit about we're talking about giving ourselves to God tonight and so I want to just talk a little bit about the pruning process. Amen. The pruning process of God. God, when we give ourselves to God, the first thing that he does is he prunes. Amen. He is a husband man. Amen. And so he deals with the vine and he prunes so that we might be fruitful. All right. And so the Bible says, I will make a fresh start with Israel. He'll burst into bloom like a crocus in the spring. He'll put down deep oak tree roots. He'll become a forest of oaks. He'll become splendid like a giant sequoia. His fragrance like a grove of cedars. Those who live near him will be blessed by him. Be blessed and prosper like golden grain. Everyone will be talking about them, spreading their fame as the vintage children of God. Ephraim is finished with gods that are no gods. From now on, I'm the one who answers and satisfies him. I am a luxuriant fruit tree. Everything you need is to be found in me. Verse 9. If you want to live well, make sure you understand all of this. If you know what's good for you, you'll learn this inside and out. God's paths get you where you want to go. Right living people walk them easily. Wrong living people are always tripping and stumbling amen and so now we'll turn to John's gospel uh, chapter 15 and I'll read verse actually I'm just well I'll read verses 1 and 2 and I'll read it in the amplified I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser any branch in me that does not bear fruit that stops bearing he cuts away trims off takes away and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Somebody say amen. All right, so tonight, just very quickly, want to talk about the, fruit, the pruning process uh, of us because we are giving ourselves to God. We are um, causing our lives to become more fruitful. That's the whole purpose of being in a relationship with God. Something's playing in here. I don't know what it is, but 
I hear something. But you, that's the whole process of a relationship with God is so that we could become fruitful. And Jesus said that our fruit might remain. Amen. And so often in scripture, we notice symbolisms. We, we know different things describe a trait or characteristic of another thing. First Corinthians chapter 10 and 4, it calls Jesus a rock and it kind of compares Jesus to a rock. Why? Because Jesus uh, has characteristics of a rock. Rocks uh, don't change. Somebody say amen. And it doesn't matter what the environment or the circumstance is. The rock remains the same. And so he is our rock. Uh, the, the song said he's a rock in a weary land. And so we know that even when uh, the children of Israel needed to get water out of the rock, it was referring to Christ. It was referring, it was a foreshadowing of who he was to be in our lives. And Moses and the children of Israel were simply able to speak to the rock. And the rock was able to fulfill them and nourish them with all that they needed. And so oftentimes man is also compared. And David compared man to a tree. And so that tree then, uh, Psalm chapter 1, uh, verse 3, if we, we turn there, you just look there very quickly, we'll see um, what David says about man right away. This is the first psalm, and this is how he introduces us. And it talks about man. Blessed is the man, I'm going to go over verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, his delight, man's delight, is in the law of the Lord. And his, man's law, does he meditate, of uh, God's law, does he meditate day and night. And he, man, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit when? In his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so I'll read that in the Amplified, verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended. Somebody say tended. By the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf all shall, shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. So we see that uh, man being compared to a tree. There are some things about man uh, that is important. Number one, it needs to be rooted. Uh, man needs to be rooted. Number two, man needs to be tended to. Amen. How many are you thankful that God tends to you? He, he makes sure that you are right and that you're healthy and that you are able to receive what is necessary. And it also goes on to say that man needs to be cleansed. And so uh, verse 4 will even speak to that, that there's a cleansing that takes place. Um, um, when you read um, John 15 and 4, there's a cleansing that takes place through this pruning process. And so, but the key element that enjoy, in, enjoins man's life to that of a tree is that man's life is expected to produce something. And there is an expected outcome for man. We were talking uh, this weekend at the Daughter Summit about me time, manifesting expectations. And oftentimes, what we're, our expectation is us expecting something from God. But there's also a reciprocal because it's covenant. God has an expectation from us. And so it is our job to allow God to do in and through us what's necessary that we might manifest his expectation. And so because we have this uh, expected outcome, each one of us have been sent to earth on a mission. I look at your neighbor and say, I'm on a mission impossible. I'm on a mission impossible. Each one of us is on a mission impossible without God. But because of God, all things are possible. So God has given each one of us a mission, something to accomplish, something that's bigger than us and above us, something that you couldn't dream that God wants you to fulfill. But because of his Holy Spirit and because he knows best, God has then given you something specific to accomplish. There's an, a desired anticipation of fruitfulness from God and God is looking for you to be fruitful there is there is an expectation that you be fruitful without any excuse amen because God knows what he has put in you Matthew chapter 7 verses 17 through 20 says even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit Every man that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby by their fruits you shall know them. So God has this expectation and has your consistency and what you continue to produce, it, it really speaks to who you are. 
because God has designed each one of us to produce a certain type of fruit. And so your tree might be an apple tree. Your tree might be a pear tree. But whatever it is, that type of fruit is going to describe who you are. Amen. And so God is looking for consistency from us. And one of the issues of the church is that uh, instead of us maintaining and posturing ourselves where we seek after fruit, we seek after gifts. Yeah, that's a problem in the church. Everybody wants to be gifted but not fruitful. And so we, we, we pay more attention to people who like to lay hands on the sick rather than people who are able to long suffer. People who are able to trust and believe God for what God has promised. We, we'd rather prophesy than be uh, walking in goodness and gentleness. Sometimes we have that, that strong, hateful prophecy because we want to scare people with our gift. Amen. Rather than encourage. The Bible says to prophesy means to exhort, edify, and comfort. It's not to scare folk because you think you can see their doomed future. If you can see my doomed future, I don't know where you've been. Amen. That's not what God is saying in this season. God is always encouraging us, admonishing us to make change because he has a bright future for us. If God's future for us was doomed, then it would be nothing we could do to turn that around. Amen. If his idea for us was to, to kill us, then there would be nothing great that we could do that could change God's mind. But God's idea for us is that we have a bright and fruitful future. And so, um, and, but then the other thing that I wrote down here was a lot of times we want the gift of speaking in tongues rather than the gift of speaking to one another. Amen. Where we, we my bishop said, I'm, I'm, I'm baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost with the gift of speaking to one another and it's the love of God that should show forth through then uh, even more than the gifts of God and and the truth of the matter is we got to remember this gifts are given but fruit is grown and so it takes some time sometimes for fruit uh, to come to its maturity and for it to be where it's supposed to be you don't start off fruitful Amen. There's also seasons when the fruit uh, becomes uh, ripe and it, and it becomes to the place where you can now bite into it and it's not poisonous or it's not dangerous for you. And as you grow older and older, those seasons of fruitfulness begin to bear even more fruit. And that's what John was saying. If you can last in this thing, you'll even bear more fruit and it'll be even more excellent fruit. At the beginning, an uh, apple tree brings you just some, just some quick, sour little apples. They're little, but if you prune it and you keep growing it year after year the apples get bigger they get redder they get juicier amen look at your neighbor and say are you juicy yet are you juicy yet and there's a maturity that comes with a juicy apple because we've given God the time to be around us and to prune us and we've given ourselves over to him we've been rooted the waters are nourishing us and God's got his hand on you amen see some people want to be all exposed but sometimes the smaller prune tree is the one God's got his hand on and uh, you'll see that here in a minute. And the one thing that we've got to know about God, God gives us gifts and the gifts are, uh, and callings are without repentance. We don't have to sweat that. Once God puts it in your life, it's there. We just got to be careful to, uh, not to abuse it or let the enemy have it. But when we consider ourselves and we are more concentrated on being fruitful, that's what keeps you closer to God. Not your gifts, it's your fruitfulness and you're willing to be fruitful because Jay-Z was gifted. Tupac was gifted. There was something that was placed in each one of them and you see how far the gift got them away from God. Because sometimes gift will cause your head to get big. That's why Paul said, man, I'm so gifted. I got it going on so much. I get so much revelation. I can see everything from the third to the first heavens. There's nothing that's beyond me. So God had to send the devil after me to buffet me, to keep me humble and bent toward him because my gift kept making me want to leave him. And that's what happened with the devil. Lucifer was so gifted and so beautiful and so wise he said maybe I can be above God maybe I can go uh, higher than his throne so your gift if you're not careful it'll cause you to leave God where your fruit fruitfulness will always keep you bent toward God but unless God buffets you with something your gift will always make you lean toward the world but God buffets us so our gift was always given back to him that's why it's always good to, to um, bring a baby before God and, and to christen a child or even sometimes I don't care how great your life is sometimes time you just need to come back to the altar because you ain't been in a while yeah yeah don't think you so grown you don't want to be at the altar you you think that that one don't pertain to you and I done got past that and, and here, here go the biggest one your arrogance says I don't want nobody to know I'm dealing with something 
But see, the fact of the matter is, it ain't if you're dealing with something, are you letting God deal with you? And so sometimes you need to come to the altar. I don't know if there's been one altar call that my bishop has given that I did not come to. Because God, I don't know if I got that problem or not. I'm trying to think I don't have that problem, but it seemed right with me. But you know what? I'm going to go up there anyway, just in case there's a little bit of that trying to grow. I need you to snip it. I need you to cut it at the root. I need you to cut it at the bud. Because if this thing ever grow, by the time I get to the altar again, I might be bearing the wrong kind of fruit and so you watch it and you watch people as they grow in church and as they get mature as they get in leadership as they get in position you start seeing them come to the altar less and less and when they come to the altar they, they don't want nobody to know they're at the altar so they act like they're altar working <laughs> I ain't asked you to work the altar I don't need no help praying I need you to come get right with God because I need you to help do ministry I need you to help another day right now slap your neighbor and say you need some help you need some help yeah you get close to the altar and somebody see you and you be like uh huh <laughs> yeah no 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 this one's for you look at your neighbor and say this bud's for me this bud's for me so God God is wanting to deal with us individually he don't want us to get beside ourselves and make us think that it's not right man I can't I love not being in charge of a service or at the end of service and I know it's anointed and I know the person that's handling the microphone is going to speak prophetically over our lives I, I, I look for places to lay down I look for an opportunity to stretch myself. Anyone ever visited with me, I, I can't wait till the man of God calls for prayer. He can preach all night long, but it's when he's getting ready to prophesy over us is when I'm ready to receive it. Watch this. And I'm not talking about prophesying smooth things. I'm talking about him talking about God exposing us and dealing with our ignorance and coming to get our sinfulness and easing up our hard ways and breaking up fallow ground. That's what I need God the most, especially when I think I'm all right. Because the Bible says, be careful. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think because fruitfulness is tough. And here's the wonderful thing about God. God does his best work in the garden. He, he is such a great gardener that when he rose from the dead, she thought he was the gardener because he does his best work in the garden. This is where God is uh, best known is for his gardening and his garden work. And so we've got to allow God to have his time with us. Remember I told you years ago, he will inspect what he expects. And so because there's an expectation on your life, an expectation on your life, there is going to be multiple inspections where God's going to bring you uh, to the place of a spiritual audit and check you where you are. The Corinthian writer said it like this. I believe it's 13 and 5 in 2 Corinthians. He said, you ought to test your own faith. You ought to, you ought to do some inspection yourself so that uh, you can see what's real with you or not was genuine and don't let other people get you pumped up see the problem with some folk is they let the accolades and the opinions of others keep them out of the face of God because people think you all right ain't nobody gonna say amen girl you so blessed you so anointed you got it going on and you know good and well you drier than a pickle You need God to do something in your life. You need to be baptized again. Somebody say baptized again. You need some more water. And that's what Hosea was trying to say in chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, is that we need to be under the shadow of God. It's, it's God's reference to us in these scriptures. When you read them again and really get revelation from God, it's God working on the plant while it's under his shadow. A, a, a good uh, nurturer, nurturer of plants they, they, I don't know why they do it in the natural but some kind of way when they go to prune and they go to deal with the plants especially in pots they pull them close and they nip and cut over top of the plant they don't reach out to cut they nip and cut over top as if their shadow has to protect them while they're cutting them Amen. Because when you cut, then things are exposed. But there is protection there uh, because that's the way uh, someone who deals with plants, or I guess it's a horticulturalist, uh, that's how they deal with dealing with plants. They put their shadows on them. But God, he's taking care of the branches and the roots and causing that which was withering to become fruitful. He said, listen, Ephraim ain't going to go after no more gods when I get through with them. 
Ephraim is going to be faithful. Ephraim is going to be one that when they see Ephraim, they're going to say, wow, he's been with God. Look at your neighbor and say, wow, looks like you've been with God. Looks like you've been with God. I mean, even if you don't see it, just prophesy. Amen. I mean, y'all tell stories about everything. Girl, your hair look good. Then you go back and tell somebody, what's wrong with her head? <laughs> I was, That's a new style. Yeah, she need to get her hair done. I didn't heard it before. I didn't heard it. You didn't know I heard the first statement, but then I heard the second statement, and I was thinking, like, she done lied to that girl. And so, <laughs> but we got some hairstylists in the room. We got some people that can hook you up. But... <laughs> So the next verse, when you read it, it talks about, uh, when you talk, look at verses 8 and 9 in Hosea, it talks about there being, uh, Ephraim being fruitful again. Somebody say again. One, one of the toughest parts in your walk with God is that you've had seasons where you were very fruitful, and then you go seasons where you're not. That's a very tough time in, in, in the kingdom as you're walking in maturity because uh, you start seeing then how much you want to see God's hand in and on your life when you don't see the production that it used to be. Almost like you're going down, like things are beginning to elude you and you're starting to slip away from God. But it's a wonderful thing when God draws you back into him. Uh, but you cannot be fruitful again without the pruning process. And what we normally do is we try to, uh, we use this old cliche that don't have nothing to do with the Bible. We try to fake it till we make it. You don't need to fake it till you make it. You just need to get back with God. Somebody say get back with God. And so and it doesn't mean, and you know, I think Christian people, uh, they, they're so scary acting and spooky. You act like uh, you got to be off into the worst sin in the world in order for you to come back to God. And coming back to God just means I'm not where I was before. Even if it's one step away, look at your neighbor and say, that's too far back. That's too far back. If, if I'm just one step away from God, I'm not caught up in a whole bunch of sin and debauchery and I ain't got a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on, but I know that my relationship isn't like it used to be, then that means some kind of way I've backslid, I've slidden back, and I'm not where I was. I want to get back to God. And, re and oftentimes we don't want to get back because we know when we get back, the first thing we're going to get is cut. Because see, that's what I like about God. God don't waste no time. He ain't going to fake like ain't nothing wrong. You, you, can, you start getting close to God. You start getting in his presence sometimes. You, the first thing you hear is... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Ch -ch 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 like, what in the Lord? What in the world is that? But the Bible talks about him having sharp shears. And so when he cuts, he don't, it don't jag and it don't take no whole bunch of time. It just come right off. Look at your neighbor saying it comes right off. It comes right off. And so in the Gospel of John, we see Jesus describing this process of fruitfulness being a process of pruning. Um, if we had it, I, I wonder if you can run real quick to John 15 and 2. And you could give it to me in the New Living and the... And the uh, Living Bible. I don't know if you can give it to me in the Living Bible, but at least the New Living Translation, where I wouldn't have to go to my computer and get it. I didn't give it to you, but it talks about this process of pruning. It says, He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce, somebody say, even more. And so that's God's intention is that every year of your life, every time this tree comes back to full bloom, that it produces even more. So the pruning process uh, in the world for fruit trees is known as this. Number one, it's, to, it's called dead wood removal. It wants to remove all the dead wood in your life. Number two, it wants you to maintain health. Number three, it wants to reduce the risk of falling. So remove dead wood, maintain health, reduce the risk of falling. And, and number four, it wants to improve the quality of the harvest. And so there'll be more to harvest. Each, each uh, of the fruit that falls from the tree will be of better quality and it'll be easier to get them. They will hang even from the low branches. And number five, obviously, is in quantity, increase the yield of the fruit, to increase the yield of the fruit. So the purpose of pruning is to remove disease, damaged, dead, non-productive, unsound, and unwanted tissue. 
that's the whole process of pruning is to get rid of diseased damaged dead non-productive unsound and unwanted tissue because unfruitful trees are only good for fuel for the fire remember any tree that bears not fruit is hewn down and cast where into the fire and so we've got to be careful because when Jesus uses those fire symbolisms he normally talking about hell and so uh, at the end of the day I don't want to be a hewn down tree uh, I want to be one that's pruned and the, and, the, and the fact of the matter is both of them getting cut on one just using scissors and the other one using a saw so if you ever hear God coming at you with a saw in a dream you better just run to the bathroom or somewhere and repent find you an altar and just ask God please Lord and so uh, we also found out that pruning is good in certain seasons. A lot of times we try to wait to get pruned when, when fruit is already coming or when the leaves are full in the tree but we don't see any fruit and we got a whole bunch of religious stuff going on. How many of you know leaves are sometimes are a sign of religion? And so uh, that's what Adam used. He hid himself uh, with leaves. He covered himself with leaves. He didn't have the fruit. He covered himself with the leaves of the fig tree. And so uh, he ran around and hid amongst the trees because he looked like a tree, but he wasn't be bearing fruit like a tree. And sometimes we run around church looking like we in church, looking like the church is supposed to look, but there's no fruit being born from our tree. And so uh, sometimes it's better, and when you talk about fruit trees in the natural, it's best that they get pruned in the winter season because there are no leaves and you can see the limbs that need to be clipped. And so sometimes you think nothing going on in your life. You're not hearing no great revelation. Yet you feel the spirit of God. But you don't sense anything dynamic going on in your life. Somebody say it's just winter time. It's just winter time. God has chosen the best season to do the pruning. So when spring comes you'll be fruitful. Amen. You don't have to wait uh, until the leaves are there. And, and your leaves confuse you uh, with fruit. And so here it is. I'm going to give you seven things and then we're out of here. And they're very easy. Number one, uh, in order to prune well, this is the pruning process. Number one, there needs to be a sharp tool. There needs to be a sharp tool so that there can be a clean cut. There needs to be a sharp tool so there can be a clean cut. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Somebody say you can't get no sharper than that. So the first thing you do in the pruning process is you've got to get into the word of God and you've got to let the word of God cut you you can't read scriptures that's going to make you shout all the time quit running to the scriptures that you done memorized that you can quote that's going to help you act like everything is alright allow the scriptures allow the text to cut you every now and then the second thing that's important in the pruning process is that we begin to remove dead wood there are things that cross us up or the cross up a fruit tree they get in the middle of the plant and what it does it keeps the sun from being able to get to all the fruit and so now without the sun s-u-n s-o-n the fruit cannot grow and it cannot remain it shrivels up and dies and so we've got to make sure things that are crossing the middle part of our lives are being removed and that dead wood is being cut out and we don't allow things to cross the middle part of us. Well, Bishop, what's the middle part of us? Somebody say my heart, my heart, my heart. And so here, Romans chapter 2, verse 29 makes it plain for us. It says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart 
in the spirit and not in the leather whose praise is not of men but of God and so we've got to make sure that we protect our heart uh, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life we've got to be careful what gets into our heart uh, the, the abundance of the heart what the mouth speaketh and so we've got to be careful not to let wood cross our heart and get in between where the sun can't get to it Sometimes we allow things to get there and the word is not penetrating it because we've allowed things to lay across the foreskins of our heart. Number three, you've got to cut close to the bud. In other words, you can't leave stubs. You can't leave stuff hanging from parts of the tree uh, just because you think you've dealt with it enough. You've got to get stuff and some stuff needs to be gotten rid of. You can't leave uh, sprouts of things there so that later on it can get fruitful again. You can't say, well, I've dealt with it enough for now. You've got to get down. Somebody say to the root of it, to the root of it. You can't leave a stub. The Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 15 said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine and what they're coming at they're coming after stubs stubs got juice in it so for an apple tree or for a fruit tree or for a vine they're coming for the juice that's in the stubs they don't mess with a lot of thorns and they don't mess with the fruit necessarily but they'll come get the juice out the stubs but if the stub gone the fox is gone and so we've got to get things down to the foxes and, and one of the things that, that, that these stubs do one of the things that God showed me about uh, these stubs that grow from the limb and him using uh, the, the entire tree as the church we've got to be careful that uh, branches don't begin to grow too far away from the larger limb and so in order for a branch to be fruitful it has to sometimes be cut back to where it's growing from the larger limb until it's a healthy limb amen and so that's, that's us trying to be uh, grown and trying to already got enough and we don't need church like we used to. And something that I said today, I don't need the voice like I used to need it because I'm grown up now. And so we have to be very careful of that. Number four, we need to prove, uh, prune all the stems that seem to be opposing the growth. Everything that opposes the growth. In fruit trees, what happens is branches begin to cross each other and they begin to compete for air they begin to compete for noticeability of the sun they begin to compete with one another and we have to cut off all competing branches everything that will compete with one another we have to cut it off you've got to let each branch grow at its own pace so that it can remain healthy but when a branch grows healthy it allows healthy nutrients to even get back into the larger limb and then the larger limb sends that nutrient back out and now other branches are healthy look at your neighbor and say when I'm healthy you're healthy when I'm, and so but, but if we've got competing branches if we've got complete, competing limbs they begin to cause each other to lose their healthiness and so you've, uh, the, the, the pruner has to then prune back unhealthy branches and so sometimes I'm just going to say it because it needs to be said sometimes when folks storm out of a church and they leave sometimes you know, some of y'all don't need to go back and try to get them <laughs> y'all ain't going to say nothing <laughs> sometimes folks be like bishop I saw so and so and I laughed with somebody not too long ago and I was telling them they need to get back I said leave them alone Everything they touched was unhealthy. Their spirit wasn't right. Sometimes we don't want to think that way, but we got to think kingdom. Everybody that come to your church ain't a part of your family. My mother fed everybody. But when it was dessert time, she sent folk home. It's time to go, baby. The light's coming on. It's 4 o'clock, Miss McGuire. Well, they're coming on soon. Why? Because she had something special for the children. And those that were close and connected and, and considered it like a home. And so we have to be careful of that. I know some people are going to take this and be like, I can't believe Bishop said that. He don't want folk back at the church. I didn't name nobody. I just said folk with a bad spirit and that spirit ain't changed. They need to let God keep working on them. Amen. So before you tell somebody they need to be back at the church, pray. Just pray. Hey! She the little boy, son the little boy say. Don't worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. May the Lord bless you.
and keep you. May he shine upon you. May he, may he make his face. What does it say? Shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Y'all still over there? Uh-uh, we moved. <laughs> well, I mean, we moving in the Lord. We moving in God. But, but a healthy branch helps to create a healthy atmosphere for other branches. Amen. And that's why we have to be careful in ministry with each other. We can't be the type of people that make the individual ministries inside the church hard to be a part of. We can't become territorial. We can't, we can't act like we're the only one with the answers. We have to be open, allow people's gifts and fruit to grow right there in front of us. Amen. And their gifts to flourish that God has given them. But then we also have to be strong enough that if that individual person is causing animosity in a ministry, we need to find another ministry for them. Because there is no gift that supersedes fruit. Amen. You can't sing, play, out dance, and out greet everybody to a point where you can just be ignorant with your attitude. Your spirit needs to be excellent. And a lot of times we panic and we put talented people in positions they can't handle. But I believe in this season, God is cutting them back. Here, look at your neighbor and say, snip, 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 snip. Yeah, God is cutting back those places. And watch this, number five, and this is the direct opposite of number four. Number five says you need to keep more horizontal branches. So when they talked about pruning the fruit tree, it said branches that go straight up are going to begin to interfere and cut fruit uh, that uh, is trying to grow on other branches. And it's going to split those fruit and it's going to cause trouble for that fruit to grow. It's going to bounce into other fruit and it's just going to be a mess. And branches that go straight down could never carry fruit. Because it's already pointing downward. So you've got to try to snip the, the branch so that you get mostly all horizontal branches. Because the horizontal branches not only are fruitful, but they also leave room for others to grow. And so God is looking for a, a, a set or a family that not only is growing and bearing fruit, but is leaving space for others to grow. Amen. And so you keep that in Psalm 133. Uh, I forgot to give you the scripture for uh, um, uh, the pruning and the stems that are opposing. I got so tickled about not asking folk to come back. Hebrews uh, chapter 12 verse 1 is the scripture that you would use for that. That we've got a great cloud of witnesses and we've got to cut back or we've got to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. And so that's our, that would be the opposing branches in your life. Those things that's coming against what God has given you so that you can run this patience. I mean run this race with patience. Amen. You've got some stuff in our lives. We've got some things going on that always hinder us from seeking God, from studying, from praying, from being serious about God. We get three or four days of godliness in and something trips us up. What caused us over the fasting period to make it one or two days and then all of a sudden we just blew it? It was called, and look at your neighbor and say, appetite, appetite. It's desire, it's, it's flesh, it's a headache. It's, it's something that gives us the excuse that we can't continue to do what it is that God had called us to do so that we could be fruitful in our spiritual lives. In some cases, we didn't even try because our lack of spirituality and maturity didn't even give it an attempt because the enemy had already told us what we can't do. And we've got to get rid of fear and doubt and the lie of the enemy. You've got to get around somebody that's doing it. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I might need your help. I might need your help. And I've got to call somebody that's done it before. Younger saints should have called older saints and said, and I'm not talking about age older. I'm just talking about in, in relationship to the word, in relationship to this fasting. And said, hey, are you fasting yet? Well, can you call me and help me? Can you pray with me? Can you make sure that I'm on track? I might not do it like you're doing it, but I want to do it better than I've ever done it. And, and then if I've never done it, I want to start off on this thing the right way. Somebody say amen. Instead of coming in lying, mustard all on your them face, and you trying to act like you ain't had nothing to eat, breath, you're burping, it smelled like baloney. We know good and well something's been going on. You ain't been on water only. But you want to give that impression, and the only person that gets food is you. Because at the end of the day, this walk is a personal walk with Christ. And I ain't got to compete with you. I just got to get better than I was. 
This is not a race about who finishes first. It's just a race that makes sure everybody finishes. Children of Israel, the Bible says everybody crossed over on dry ground. So I didn't have to cross over first. Matter of fact, if I was the first one over there, I was hot waiting on the rest of these folks. Like, are y'all going to ever get over here? No instruction, can't eat, can't do nothing. I need to be in the middle of the pack. We learned in prison, last is the, is the next first. We would just wait. We let everybody go eat. They let everybody go eat. The whole line, 500 people get ready to go eat. And they say, McGuire, you the last one. I'd be like, uh-huh, I'm the first one. Ain't nobody here. As soon as I got here, I got right up to the front. And the Bible says the first shall be what? And the last shall be what? I love that parable in the Bible where it talks about these one folk, they worked all day long and got two pennies. Then these other cats came at the 11th hour and they said, if you work this one hour, I'm going to give you two pennies. And they said, bet, I'll take that. And they worked and everybody that worked all day said, man, I can't understand it. They worked an hour, we don't work 12 hours and both got two pennies. He said, that's what you signed the contract for. We was paying two pennies for who anybody that worked. It didn't matter how long you worked. Amen. Slap three people say, I came at the right time. Now you ain't got it. We all spread out. Just point at them. Just point at them. It's a phantom high five. Just phantom, phantom. I'll say that for the tape. There's people all over this sanctuary. They budged up against each other. 500 folk on a Sunday night in Jesus' name. And so, uh, so Hebrews 10.25, watch this. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. This ought to be a time where we are stretching out. This horizontal branch also represents the horizontal branch on the cross. The cross is, is made of two branches, one vertical, one horizontal. The first five of the Ten Commandments have to do with you and God. The second six through ten, that second five has to do with you and man. And so if my horizontal is jacked up, then something must be wrong with my vertical. Because my vertical is going to help me produce a horizontal relationship. If I don't have a good relationship with other Christians, then I probably don't have a real good relationship with God. Because God said, how can you love me who you've never seen? And you've got issues with all the brethren that's around you. Your personality is so jacked up that people don't even want to be around you. And you cause confusion and frustration with everybody you around. But yet you're trying to act like you got a great relationship with me. That's not me. And as mature saints, we, we got to be in a place where we, we are magnetizing people to the house of God, to the kingdom of God, and to the ministries that we're involved in. They want to be a part of it because we're a part of it. I wanna, what, what ministry are you in? I want to be a part of that. If everybody like you. If everybody was just like you, how many people would be in the ministry that you're in? How prosperous would the church be? And I'm not saying because you got things going on. I'm saying personality-wise, love-wise, congeniality-wise, forgiving-wise, mercy-wise. Amen. Psalm 133 says, Oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it goes on to talk about this ointment that flows. And at the end of it, it says, There God commands the blessing." So when we're able to stretch out heart to heart, when we're able to have great horizontal relationships, then God is able to do some amazing things both corporately and individually. My commanded blessing might be contingent on my congeniality. Isn't that amazing? My love for the brethren might be my ticket to my next miracle. Not my gift. Your gift can't impress God. He gave it to you. Now Job said the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Now Fred Price would say, well, that ain't God. God ain't an Indian giver. Job made a statement. It's a real statement, but it's not true. But then Jesus said to him that have, even more shall be given. And him that have not, even that which he has shall be taken away. So whatever that is, I don't want him to take it back. If he gave it to me. Amen. Number six. The best way to prune a tree now is you got to remove shoots. 
things that absorb the anointing. Normally you find shoots around the root of a tree or you find shoots around uh, growing up from the bottom and, and hitting a particular branch. These are things that shoot. And, and another name you guys have heard me refer to this before is suckers. And that is a, a, a term used in pruning. You've got suckers that come. And what they do is they grow up in the root and they begin to absorb on the nutrient that something fruitful uh, has in it because it's trying to grow itself but it's bearing no fruit they're just shooters and suckers amen and so we've got to kill them from the root because even if you cut them in half they grow from where you cut them and a lot of times that's what we do we just cut things halfway and then we don't pay attention to it anymore and before we know it it's had exponential growth on us and it's gotten, it's gotten strong because it's wrapped itself around us almost like a boa constrictor. And then it begins to put itself in us and it begins to absorb it. We've got to learn to live sucker free. We've got to, we've got to learn to not allow things to absorb our anointing and to get in our way. And that every time we seem to be growing in God, it's the same people. You've got to put a block on your phone. You're going to have to lose that direction because every time I seem to be growing in God, my relationship with these people start flourishing again and they ain't trying to do nothing with the Lord. And you're going to have to recognize that, that the devil keeps popping them up close to you again right when you seem to be on fire for God. And once you mention God or once you mention a word in church and service, they really ain't on that. But for some reason, they always around. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a sucker. That's a sucker. That's a sucker. And I've got to learn to live sucker free. Listen, and the only person that can help you live sucker free is you and the Holy Ghost. You got to be the one to say, you know what? That's my dude. That's my girl. That's my family. That's my peace. But you know what? My witness right now in their face isn't working. So what I might have to do is disconnect myself and let that testimony help them. When you say right now, uh-uh, that, that's, what, that's what they said. Nehemiah's group said, uh-uh, right now, I can't come down. We, and they, listen, and they was, in, they was trying to bring them to a place called Oh No. Look at your neighbor and say, oh no, sucker. Oh, oh no, sucker. I ain't, oh no. Oh no, sucker. I'm not getting ready to go for that. That's the trick. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil is a liar. I don't know, but it's got to be true because if it happened to me, I got to figure it happened to everybody. I got I to imagine that the devil ain't just aiming at me, that right when I seem to be in my grace, greatest revelatory season of my life and I seem to be flowing, people from the past and people that you know is up to craziness, all of a sudden, how the ham fat you get my number? And that's because the devil is strategic. He's trying to steal from you. He's trying to grab from you. And the more he can get from you, watch this, while you're ready to be fruitful, the more he can use to be fruitful himself. Don't you think the devil run from anointed people? He like anointed people. Talking about I'm anointed, the devil gonna leave me alone. Shoot, he just saw you from across the room. You got on the loudest perfume in the club. Are you kidding me? Anointing? You can smell anointing a mile away. Look at your neighbor and say, I smelt you coming in, girl. I smelt you, dude, from a mile away. Anointing's got something on it. Somebody ever walked in somewhere and you looked, and even yourself, you weren't like, who was that? <laughs> they was anointed. Number seven. We've cut dead things, we've sliced some, some limbs, we've got everything vertical and horizontal, I mean vertical up and down, out the way. We've made sure every competing branch is gone, stuff that's tried to cut across the middle of our heart, we've gotten rid of those things, and now, and, and now you've got to get rid of debris. Because here's the funny thing about debris. It's dying. It can't hurt you in and of itself. But in the debris holds the pests and the diseases. It's in the debris. And so now, just because the limb look like it's gone, 
if we didn't throw it in the fire we let it lay near the root of the tree and now the pests and the disease from the debris get in the tree and we start asking ourselves these kind of questions I thought that thing was dead attitudes pop up don't raise your hand don't raise your hand but have you ever just cussed somebody slap out out in the middle of nowhere and then you tried to figure out where that just came from just went straight off on somebody now listen cussing don't mean nasty words you ain't got to say MF to be cussing here, here, let me help parents with a cuss word I'm sick of you you get on my nerves I'm tired of you if I hear it again what? Look at your neighbor and say, that's cussing. I wish I should have. And then you go back to your room and you try to figure out where did that come from? That's the disease that set in the dead wood. You cut it, you just didn't get rid of it. You trip up with your salvation. You get confused about your anointing. You, you oscillate about your placement from God. You wonder where you're supposed to be. You doubt what God is doing in your life. That's disease from the debris. I'm wondering if I'm supposed to that's disease dis-ease because if I heard God before I should be hearing God now and if God ain't said nothing different than what he said then what am I tripping on so God we thank you we love you and we, we accept and invite the pruning process we know that sometimes just like when you are chastening it don't feel good in the moment but we know that it shall bear fruit of righteousness so God we just ask tonight that uh, as we bring our consecration to another level giving ourselves over to you allowing you to to have full access to our heart allowing the word to penetrate and do what it needs to do God we know that even sometimes in our lives you allow circumstances to come up so that you can speak to us slow us down so we can hear your voice that our busyness doesn't get in the way of your plan for us and so God we apologize that you even have to do that but we deliver ourselves over to you tonight we thank you because you are a God of pity and mercy you recognize that we're just flesh and we're just worms and so God you do it with great craftiness you do it with uh, shrewdness and strategy that we can't explain we, we learned a word today that describes you your perspicaciousness is beyond our thoughts and minds we can't fathom how you know everything before it even takes place and that you warn us and protect us from the enemy and even from ourselves. Help us tonight in this communion to day by day deliver more of ourselves over to you. And if we've been on this journey for years and we feel pretty confident and pretty good about having ourselves in your hand and living upright and not having vices and things that would hinder not only our relationship with you but hinder someone else having a relationship with you because of what they see on our lives places where we haven't been fully delivered places that we haven't conquered but we're feeling good about our relationship with you help us to bring that stuff to God help us to let our private holiness match our public holiness people think we're anointed and great and wonderful but we know some stuff about ourselves some secrets that need to come before the throne so over these next 21 days consecrate us afresh as we pray tonight just allow us to see you 
in your splendor and your majesty over our lives. Thank you so much. We glorify you. We magnify you. We exalt you. We brag on you. And the bravura and the panesh that we wear, it's godliness because we want to be just like you. We love you. We glorify you. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on up and grab your elements. Tonight's communion, we just, we just, we've had scripture, so we don't have to reread scripture. But as you're coming, just think on about allowing God to prune your life. Sitting still long enough for him to cut and trim and make ready the limbs of your lives so that it might be fruitful and your fruit might remain. And where you've been fruitful, God wants you to bear even more fruit. The Amplified said, more excellent fruit. Paul said to the church at Corinth that I want to show you a more excellent way. And oftentimes the fruit that God wants to improve in our lives is the fruit of love. The fruit of forgiveness and the fruit of mercy. It's known as the royal law. We can all walk in mercy and love and hope and expectation for others. As we live on assignment, we're patient with one another, long suffering with one another, recognizing that God has a plan for each and every one of us. Trusting God as He's connecting us as family and as one fellowship. wanting to take our rightful place in the service of God doing what it is that God has called us to do being compelled and not doing it out of convenience and knowing that even when it doesn't feel good that God has a process that's perfect and just looking back over our lives knowing that God has a resume with us he's done some great things in us even when we weren't even trying to let him just thanking God for his love and his goodness and being able to look into the mirror and recognizing yourself as God's handiwork. Knowing full well that you wouldn't be where you are without God. But even if you count your own deficiencies, knowing that God will not leave you there. Because he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So tonight with great thanksgiving, we're remembering the Lord's death until he comes. We're remembering the sacrifice of his own life for you. Perfect for the sinful. And now becoming sin, he's made us the righteousness of God in him. And the wonderful result of his resurrection is now that as he's ascended into heaven, we too now are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's there on the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. His Holy Spirit in us, Emmanuel. God with us now, not only sealing our salvation, but leading us and guiding us into all truth. Fixing and cleansing everything on the inside of us that's not like God. Having redeemed us through the washing and regeneration of the Word and the Holy Spirit burning off all the dross so that the genuine jewel and gem that we are could shine forth. God, we love you so much for loving us so much because we love you because you first loved us. We thank you and we honor you for these days that are coming upon us, these 21 nights 
where you're going to even make us greater and better where a personal reflection of you would be clear to those that see it we love and we honor you sir thank you for the blood for the healing power that heals us of all of our diseases every sickness, grief and pain that it's covered tonight because of the blood of Jesus Christ we love and we honor you sir as we eat and drink together so for the next few minutes as the music plays if you want to pray personally on the altar at your seat you are able to do that we're praying tonight for personal consecration that we give our lives over to God 